Roger, we're at the conference here in Tucson toward a science of consciousness. It's the 20th anniversary. You've been working with consciousness, I think, for more than 25 years, uh, even before this conference began. And when it started, and I came at it from a, a neurophysiological background, uh, everyone seemed to think that uh, biological naturalism with different terms, uh, the neurobiology of the brain would be sufficient. It may take uh, 50 years, may take a thousand years, but the biological basics of the brain will be able to explain consciousness. And the more science progressed, the more we'd understand. In recent years, there's been the opposite trend. It's fascinating that there are an increasing number of panpsychics uh, in terms of their view that you have to Im imbue consciousness with all matter. And there are some theories of quantum physics or integrated information and phase space. And, looking at some radical ideas. Uh, how do you account for this divergence from the, the traditional neurobiology? Well, I think these speculations have become more respectable in a sense. I think in the time when I got involved and wrote The Emperor's New Mind, I think it was regarded as a bit risky for any yes. serious scientist to write something which had to do with consciousness. Yes. It, was, it was a taboo subject. Yeah. But it has become more serious and, and serious scientists in a sense are allowed to talk about it so maybe they voice their views more than they would have done previously yeah. i don't know if it's just that it's certainly true that the scheme which stuart hammeroff and i developed in the late 90s uh which we refer to as orc or uh that scheme has has sort of survived i mean the, the scheme itself has has been modified it's not exactly as we put it for forward originally but it has become one of the accepted possibilities, which in a way I'm a little surprised about because I thought originally, you know, everybody was dismissive of these things so completely that, that uh, it wouldn't become, you know, see, I mean, that don't mean I thought I would dismiss it. I think the theory uh, makes a lot of sense, but uh, it has been taken much more seriously among other theories as well. Uh, which might be regarded as a little bit wild and mm -hmm. it, it, it would have been regarded as wild. Yeah, I, I think there are two views. One is the, the, core, the, the basic scientific view and the other is what I might call the sociological view as you yes. analyze this development of it, it, acceptance, willing to entertain at least some very radical ideas that might have been looked upon in the past as fringe ideas. Uh, has become more widespread among serious scientists. I think that's true. I think it's partly that scientists have become bolder and they're, they're, they're prepared to make <laughs> statements about consciousness and, and then you get the variety of ideas that, that people naturally have on this topic. Uh, how about the concept that uh, philosophers and some scientists now have will, are really investing in every, every uh, uh, particle of matter in the universe, some sort of proto-consciousness that you need in as a fundamental force, mm. a fifth fundamental force, if you will, and then when you get enough of them together, you can have consciousness like we, but you need that fundamental force in the universe. Yes, I should explain that the ORC OR scheme, which I've been developing with... That's Stuart orchestrated... Hamm orchestrated objective reduction. The OR stands for... OR stands for two things at once, one OR, right. and the other objective reduction. Okay. It means the quantum state, Schrodinger's cat, if you like, is either dead or alive. Right, right, right. But that requires something deviating from the standard evolution of Schrodinger, which quantum mechanics would normally demand. So you've right. got to understand. Uh, but in our scheme, OR is an objective reduction of the state. So it does, if you like, Schrodinger's cat actually does become dead yeah. or alive way before you, you look at it. So that's a, it's a new physics which isn't part of standard quantum mechanics. But that's the view that I believe anyway, for other reasons. But the claim here is that, not saying that it's a fifth force or goodness knows what, that it is every time a quantum state, which is in a superposition of two things, so a particle being here and here at the same time, when that becomes a sufficient mass displacement, then it becomes one or the other. And that's a time scale for that to become one or the other. And the idea is that when that happens, there is an element of proto-consciousness. Now, I'm calling it not really consciousness because there isn't, it's not organized in any way. It's just happening all the time, randomly throughout the right, universe. Right. So let's call that proto-consciousness. It's, if you like, a, a very, very basic element of awareness or something going on. And it's the ingredient out of which consciousness is, is made. So 
And that occurs everywhere and at all times? At all, all times, well, it, it, I wouldn't say at all times, but it, it, most, most of the time it, it's when the quantum system gets to a level where there is enough mass displacement between oh, superposed okay. states okay. that it has to become one or the other. And when that, that choice as to which it becomes, if you like, there's a, a choice of some sort made in the world, and that choice is not organized in any way, so it doesn't really qualify as genuine consciousness or anything like that. But it is the basic ingredient in our scheme whereby consciousness comes about. So when people talk about the hard problem, that is to say, how can you have um, something different coming in, which is perception or awareness right, or right. whatever it is, which isn't part of standard um, evolution of uh, ordinary physical system, well, that is because you have, in an orchestrated way, these proto-consciousness elements coming together in a coherent way, and that is, is what constitutes consciousness on this particular view. And you would not say that that is the equivalent of a, of a fifth force or something unique, no. uh, which the panpsychics would. They would say, whatever it is, there is something of a proto-conscious nature I everywhere. Well, it's nothing like a force, you see. It would be wrong to think of it as, a, as another force. Right. It's, it's part of the way quantum mechanics becomes classical mechanics. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, we have these completely different, seemingly, seemingly completely different worlds, you know, where particles can be in two places at the same time and all that sort of stuff. That's how quantum mechanics works, and it works marvelously well. There's no question that we can explain so many things, an amazing number of mm -hmm. things, using quantum mechanics, which we would never have been able to explain classically. One of the most basic being, you know, spectral lines. You have these very specific frequencies that come about when uh, atoms go from one state to another, mm -hmm. and that's a discrete thing. Well, now that's quantum mechanics. Now all these things are happening at a level where there is not very much displacement of mass. When it gets to the level where the superpositions involve a significant mass displacement, and significant mass has to be defined exactly what it is, but it's still quite small from, mm. from our classical terms, a significant amount of displacement of mass, then it does one or the other. And that is not part of standard evolution, Schrodinger mm. evolution. You need the other part of quantum mechanics, which is normally called making a measurement. But then what's a making a measurement? You see, it's the measuring device should also be following the Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's it, where does the measurement come from? Right. Well, I'm saying it always comes, whatever the measurement is, whether it's somebody making a measurement or spontaneously happening in the world, it's always because the, the mass displacement becomes one or the other. And when that happens, there is associated with it, on our scheme, an element of proto-consciousness. Now normally it's totally disorganized, there's no genuine consciousness involved, However, in the brain, the brain kind of manages to get all these things together in a coherent way, and this is, these little things are the, the proto-consciousness elements, are out of, the things out of which consciousness is built. That's, that's the view we're taking. But it's not right to think of it as, a, as another force or anything like another force. It's, it's not that. It's, it's just an essential part of way, the way the quantum world becomes the classical world. And without that, you would have superpositions all over the place. You see, we would be in many places at once all the time, and so on. I mean, many there are views that many worlds view of quantum mechanics, which says that happened. You see, I'm denying that. I'm saying it doesn't do that. There is one world, but which world it's, it comes about? That's always through this objective reduction, and that objective reduction is always, in this view, accompanied by an element of proto-consciousness, not a real consciousness, because it's such a trivial little thing. You might as well call it random. <laughs>